George Washington went get into the city. Uh, a lot of truck was in our side. But anyway, he's coming in the 30 seconds. I'll see you soon. Okay. okay. I think so.
was on. I mean the dark. Maybe that's good. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Yes, yes, yes. Generally, there's a simple solution to most things. I have to, what do I have to do? This one? It's not going to work. I think I do have to break down and actually get a haircut. So, here we are once again. Welcome to those of you who are somehow still with me, haven't tired of all of this. I have to say that um, for me, th things, of course, because life now is more complicated in a certain sense than it was earlier uh, when we were all staying home, of course, uh, that this is become more difficult. And before I begin with anything else, I will mention that next week there will be no Friday live stream, but I will hope to post something. And I hope that that will actually start a transition to a kind of video log which, which perhaps I will, I will do at different times, but we will post at a specific time. So I don't have to be available at one time. And also that you who are watching this don't have to be here at one time. I'm uh, trying to find a way that, that we can have also comments, things like that, in an easy way. Also, uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping that we will be able to move the archive of all the live streams. I think probably we will, we will uh, cut out my political harangues. Uh, maybe we'll put them somewhere else separately. Uh, but, and put the musical sections it, all, all cataloged in a, in a uh, in nice way, let's say, uh, on my YouTube channel, which so far is inert. But I hope will become more <coughs> active. As of, uh, these are my big hopes for for this little endeavor of ours. We'll see if they come to fruition. Okay. Uh, once again, there are so many things to talk about, and I am very, very disorganized. Uh, but what I mostly want to talk about especially since today is an anniversary of the great stock market crash, 1929, which actually presaged the Great Depression, which uh, overtook both the United States and the world soon after this. Uh, and as a kind of prelude to that, I read in this morning it's in the New York Times. It's an, an op-ed by Josh Howley, who is a Republican senator from Missouri, who uh, <clears throat> was talking about the, the supply chain crisis, which is what has uh, overtaken the news and actually probably uh, has become the, maybe the most important uh, issue right at the moment not only in the United States, but in the world at large. And uh, I will be speaking pretty much about that. Uh, yeah. 
but this uh, op-ed, it, it basically was very normal talk, talking about how we have to bring uh, <clears throat> manufacturing capability back to the United States and, and we have to find uh, what we call a, a essential uh, manufacturing and the government should somehow mandate that that has to be done in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. These are all things that, in fact, the Biden administration also is proposing. So it's nothing new from, from Josh Hawley. And also, it's not anything uh, that hasn't been talked about for years and years. And he does uh, mention that the problems that we have have been brewing for decades. Uh, yeah, exactly. But what struck me f most is anyway this sort of casual remark at the beginning this i just read you the beginning of, of his uh, op-ed america is mired in a supply chain crisis okay imports are slow to arrive items on store shelves are becoming more scarce and prices are rising of course uh, we know that this is not happening everywhere in the united states but there are certain places where it's really happening certain places where it's not that's another issue uh, completely, uh, but a very important one. Uh, now, the next sentence from, from what he said is this. President Biden's reckless spending policy is the immediate cause of these higher prices. But he says then, blah, blah, but the problems have been brewing for decades. Now, this is little kind of... Uh, uh, sequence of, of buzzwords to get people concerned about the Biden administration, about the present administration. But the fact, in fact, is that the present administration is, to this day, simply debating spending bills, trying to pare them down. They have not spent, aside from what is specifically targeted at lowering rate, the rate of COVID-19 infections. That's a sort of emergency spending, but uh, if we didn't spend that kind of money, probably we would not be coming out of the pandemic as we are. And actually, this is, there's good news on that front in the United States. Uh, last week, I actually highlighted how this good news is not world wide, but, uh, and that is still cause for a lot of concern, but in the United States there is a definite kind of sequential drop in, in infections and in fatalities now, although probably fatalities in the United States have been maybe at least a million, maybe more although the official statistics are less than that. And no matter what, the total number so of fatalities to this day of the COVID-19 pandemic have exceeded the fatalities, as I mentioned in a previous live stream, the fatalities uh, during the pandemic of the Spanish flu. Yeah. Uh, so these are very grim statistics in any case, which will live on in history. But, of course, Biden has not spent. What has been spent was, was spent from the previous administration that way. So this is, anyway, a kind of, uh, you know, political deflection to what is happening. And... Oops, I always forget to do this. Excuse me, I have to make sure. I know I do this is wrong. Uh, that my iPad doesn't quit in the middle of everything. Okay, now I go back. So, 
this. That said, I will come back to uh, economics in a minute, but I want to move a bit to Facebook once again, which I, I talked about in my uh, introduction this way, this, and how the uh, road to perdition is uh, once again paved with so-called good intentions, although these are not good intentions, they're just intentions for uh, good profits, for, let's say. Uh, and I, I uh, let me see, I have this here, but I was just talking, amused by This Facebook's uh, change of name, they say, to Meta. Uh, and and as I was wondering in my <clears throat> introduction, how, one second, let me see this. I'm, I have a, a totally crazy... Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm. I've got this. Uh, but I don't have everything I need. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll. I'll. I'll piece it together. What I want to say. <clears throat> little by little. Uh, so Meta, of course, uh, I think I, I just, let's see, no, this, I have everything organized except for this. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh -huh. uh, I was wondering what, what uh, uh, AI algorithm came up with this name of Meta, which is I've, I found very funny. And apparently it's, it's been mocked quite a bit uh, on Facebook, among other platforms. Uh, Meta in, in Greece means kind of what is in the future, what happens. But it's sort of, and uh, we find it, of course, in metastasis which actually, I think, really applies perhaps now to Facebook. It's, it's a kind of social metastasis. That's uh, uh, and this is, of course, the essential problem of cancer, metastasis. And also, it applies to metamorphosis. And that is what struck me at first. And uh, of course, uh, coming from the Kafka novelette, I should say, it's a small novel called The Metamorphosis. And a metamorphosis, of course, is the process of transformation from an immature to an adult form and is most often applied to insects, of course. Uh, so that's that. Now, uh, here. Yeah, I, I speak a little bit about the Kafka metamorphosis because <clears throat> this meta of, of Facebook somehow really uh, <clears throat> brought back to me, the the whole subject of the of the this uh, novelette of, of Franz Kafka. Uh, okay, now what that does it tells the story of this fellow Gregor Samsa, who wakes up one morning and finds that he's metastasized, and I'm sorry, not metastasized, metamorphosized into 
a large insect uh, generally known as a cockroach. Uh, and of course, it, his family is very distraught, etc., etc., and uh, finally he, he dies, and this and that. Uh, for those of you who haven't read the book, it's very so short, very compelling, and very thought-provoking. It has, a, it has a sister, Greta, and it's about basically the two of them. Uh, and she begins to, uh, she starts out by being the only one who really supports him and tries to give, make him more comfortable in his insect persona. Uh, but then finally, uh, she sort of gives up on him as well. But, okay, so, this meta, meta. It reminds me, actually, of uh, the logo, which uh, a few years ago was posted for everyone to see on, uh, in Lincoln Center and other places about the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, the Phil. And uh, am I doing okay when the video wise? Yeah. Yeah? I'm glad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that was the, the New York Phil, it just doesn't get any better. Now, this is a peculiarity of the English language, which is uh, very rife with these kind of d double entendres, these are two meanings. Uh, and I think that probably some, some uh, advertising agency got paid a lot of money for that little quote. And here it was all over the place. The New York Phil, it just doesn't get any better. So this is not quite the same, but the, the kind of uh, ridiculousness which Meta conjures up very uh, quickly is in, in a way uh, similarly ridiculous. Well, I said ridiculous a few times, yeah, just as far emphasis. Uh, and in the, wait, here I go back to here. Sorry, I want to get back to my, my thing. So, uh, in the case of Facebook, I think that what it conjures up actually is very realistic in terms of the development of, of this platform, organization, uh, social entity, I should say, which is, a, yeah. uh, okay, now I, I move uh, on a little bit to more, well, this is actually still has to do uh, a bit with, with Facebook, uh, which is, and has to do with Fauci, that's it, and who has been castigated recently in the conservative media and promoted by uh, different platforms, different uh, uh, news, and I would say fake news outlets. They say cruel Fauci is condemned for experiments which have seen beagles. These are these are dogs. These little cute dogs, who have been debarked and trapped in cages so flies can eat them alive. This is all in the name of so-called science. 
So this, uh, this Fauci has become a monster in the eyes of this. Of course, uh, this was, I uh, was mentioning this, a Tunisian research lab where beagle puppies were force-fed a new drug for that. And what, what it, there's an, uh, in other headlines, the monster, what next, Fauci? Setting kittens' tails on fires, pulling appendages off daddy long legs while watching cockfights, etc., etc. As it turns out, this is all incredibly far from the truth. And it tells much more about the right-wing disinformation machine and its crusade against, uh, I would say, medical uh, science than it does about any research that was founded by, now this is the point, Fauci's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Uh, you can go read more about it, but I'm going to to move on because I wanted to, to try to go a little bit uh, more quickly through everything that I need. Uh, now, still in the news, of course, is uh, resonance from an article by Hunter Walker in the Rolling Stone which, uh, which stated very clearly that multiple people associated with the March for Trump and Stop the Steal events communicated with members throughout, the Jan throughout January 6th and before that, to say that uh, they participated in dozens of planning meetings with members of Congress and White House staff, especially uh, with the... the uh, Representative Paul Gosar of Arizona, Lauren Bobart of, I'm probably sp s pronouncing all these incorrectly, no matter what. I always do that. Uh, another Republican from Colorado, Mo Brooks from Alabama, Madison Cawthorn from North Carolina, Andy Biggs from Arizona, uh, Louis uh, Gomart from Texas, and others, of course. That's uh... Now, Gosar, who is very much in the news about this, he, he dangled the possibility, apparently. This is uh, in the uh, Rolling Stone and Washington Post. About Sources said that he dangled the possibilities of a blanket pardon in an unrelated ongoing investigation to encourage them to plan the protest. Uh, an organizer who was talking to members of Congress now uh, mentioned that our impression was that it was a done deal, that he'd spoken to the president about it in a meeting about pardons and that our names came up. They were working on and submitting the paperwork and getting members of the House Freedom Caucus to sign in and show us uh, as a show of support. Uh, it's really something. Now, these are people who, in fact, were involved in what is called sedition. And from the 14th, the third section of the 14th Amendment of the Con Constitution, from, that is, no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector or president or vice president or hold any office under the United States or, uh, or under any state, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress, blah, 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 or as a member of any uh, state legislature as, or as an executive, judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution, shall have, who shall have engaged in insurrection or, rebel or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Congress, that's right. So that means that, of course, Congress has the authority to expel from office 
any officer of the government who engages in sedition. Uh, well, I hope there's a little more activity on that front happening. Uh, Okay, that's there's so much more to do, but I want to move on now. I think just just one second. Let me because I'm I'm am quite uh, scattered in my notes here. I usually put them together, but somehow I've been a little too tired. To wake up early enough after going to sleep late so late in order to do this before our live streams which is another reason why I, I will definitely move to another vid but video format so I will be speaking with you and not simply writing although I'll still write the introductions anyway. uh, famous last words anyway I go back now to 1929, and after that, to the uh, Great Depression, which uh, after the 29, what happened was progressively the, the economy began to shut down, and by 1933, good one out of every four Americans were out of work. And worldwide, there was great effects, too. I don't know the statistics about that. Uh, I should mention that uh, the, uh, historian Heather Cox Richardson has done a very nice uh, job in her blogs uh, detailing a lot of historical connections between today and in the past, et cetera, et cetera. I really uh, uh, <clears throat> encourage all of you to uh, actually subscribe to her blog. It's very, it's, it's very, very informative. In any case, I come back to this period from 1929 through the early 1930s. Now, this is this is comes from uh, uh, Heather Cox Richardson, uh, as she writes. Wealthy Americans, though, were sure they know what caused it. This is the depression, the the shutdown of the economy. The problem they said was that poor Americans refused to work hard enough, and were draining the economy, and they must be forced to take less, not more. Okay, and then you have this, the famous quote of the Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, who's a very poisonous fellow, uh, and that is liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate. It will purge the rottenness out of the system. High costs of living and high living will come down. People will work harder and live a more moral life. This is, I will talk about morals also. Values will be adjusted and enterprising pick up people will pick up the wrecks from less competent people. Uh, now, we're hearing echoes of that today, actually, where the, the issues of uh, unemployment insurance in the United States and sort of extending benefits and saying, well, what that does is that that makes people lazy. They don't want to work. They also, raising the uh, wages or demanding higher wages is, yes, that, that makes it more difficult for business this way, et cetera, et cetera. This is uh, uh, really not very different in its beginnings from what was happening after 1929. Okay, 
Now, we, we move back there to President Hoover, uh, Herbert Hoover, and uh, I, there's an institute, conservative institute, in his name, which is constantly coming out with, with uh, uh, positions, with articles, with so-called scholarly articles, which are just press releases for the wealthy, I would say. Uh, although there are, I, I do sort of follow that a little bit, and sometimes there are kind of interesting things that come out. I wonder if they're just sort of uh, escape sensors or whatever. But uh, and going back to President uh, Herbert Hoover, he said he tried to reverse the economic slide by cutting taxes, of course, uh-huh, and reassuring Americans that the fundamental business of this country, that's production and distribution of commodities, is on a sound and prosperous basis. Uh, now, the thing is that taxes were already very low, and cutting taxes further for the majority of people that he did really did not do much because the actual dollar amount was very, very little. And the problem was that the country had to be jump-started to provide jobs and programs for people to actually uh, start actually earning decent livings again. Now, FDR's New Deal, of course, employed huge amounts of people. They built highways, bridges, uh, public buildings. They did many things. They did not do everything, of course. They uh, invested in infrastructure mostly, but not only that. And then uh, when World War II broke out, in fact, the fact that the country had been mobilized in a way allowed it to in a certain way, mobilize even more and uh, come out of that as the superpower which it became. Uh, Oh, God, there's so much to do. Now, what I want to uh, speak about is the problem of... Here, let me, let me go back. I have, I have this here. Oh, it's so, so much. I think I will maybe even write about a bit of this in more detail for everyone. That, that may be the better way to do this, but uh, here, yes. Now, the, what is called the Build Back Better plan of the Biden administration which of course has not yet really been put into effect, it's still, has progressively been whittled down. And that's what I'm very worried about, in fact, because uh, what we've seen in the past in that, is that the stimulus or programs which are not uh, invested in, in uh, with enough intensity, I should say, and with, were not fully uh, funded in a way, uh, in, in fact, are become, uh, well, ineffective in, in a way. And I look back to Lyndon Johnson, President in the 
the 1960s after uh, Kennedy was assassinated and then for one more term, uh, who instituted a remarkable federal program, the sort of great society program with, again, with uh, civil rights legislation, with, with uh, infrastructure, with very many things, and, and even be trying to raise the general economic level of everybody in the United States. Now, that has been looked by and has been uh, denigrated by, by Republicans and by, by people on the conservative right as saying, you see, we have had a government program, it's ineffective, it did actually worse than everything. But the fact is that it was never funded in a way to make it effective. What came uh, in the middle of this, of course, was the debacle of the Vietnam War. And that actually skewed not only government funding, but also attention for what could have been a transformative domestic effort. And now I worry about this, this better build back plan that's desperate, that it will also be underfunded in a way that will uh, actually undercut its effectiveness, I should say. Underfunding undercuts. Uh, the, uh, of course, then we, going back a little ways, we have in 2008, that we had the Great Recession, so-called, and of course, that the, the stimulus that was uh, supposed to help everyone was also undercut. And was not nearly as effective as it should have been. Earlier than that, and you had this period of what was called stagflation, and you had Paul Volcker, who was the head of the Fed at that time, and instead of stimulating the economy, what he did was he imposed great austerity, which I see as the beginning of this slide towards great uh, inequality of wealth that we have now. Uh, okay. Now, the Biden administration had, has, does have uh, certain good ideas, and I hope that they remain. Now, he, uh, President Biden did issue an executive order on antitrust. Antitrust is uh, traditionally focused on monopolies. So these are in industries, businesses, which control uh, the overwhelming access to certain goods, let's say, that way. Uh, the most famous one was early on, AT&T was, was the, the monopoly uh, for telecommunications, and that was actually broken up in the United States. But there is something else which is called monopsony, and that is not only the power over selling goods, that's not the power over selling goods, but that is the power over people who are working. So, uh, this is, a, a, I'm reading this now from uh, the Washington Post. This is talking about this. So let's say, if a small town has just one newspaper, and the newspaper is both monopoly over local news 
and the newspaper will have a monopsony over journalists, over the people who are working there. You see. So if a town has only a single automobile manufacturing plant, it also has a monopsony over the skilled workers who are actually working there. But it does not have a monopoly over cars because cars are sold uh, on, throughout the, na the nation. And there are, of course, different car companies and different uh, car uh, models that for people can can buy. So it's not a, that's not a matter of monopoly, but that plant has a monopsony. And these are the basically sort of uh, uh, what's it called factory towns that have have that grew up in the United States are monopsonies. And that's also why as business moved out of the United States, these towns failed completely. That's uh, that way. Now, the uh, antitrust or order of Biden that actually does uh, include government resources to ensure that antitrust laws are used to help workers and not simply to break up uh, companies which are, are have too much control over particular goods that way. Uh, I do hope that this continues. Now, of course, the biggest issue that we have in, in the United States is the actual uh, dramatic reduction of the power of unions and of the membership of unions. Uh, and that is the, the basic way that uh, workers or people in, in jobs, in fact, can create an opposition to what's called capital. That's it. Yeah. Okay, now, uh, I keep, talking about this, uh, this issue, and this now has to do with what these call supply chain shortages. And in this case, I see uh, that our present administration is, in, in fact, still uh, prisoner of the mindset of neoliberalism, anyway, and the, in, in, in a certain sense, you can say that the actual aim of ne neoliberalism was to reduce labor rights for the benefit of investors. And you have a, an, a pursuit of efficiency, which I've I had talked about in the past, even at the expense of increasing risk for, to the, the company itself, the companies, I should say, or even the system. This is uh, so. Of course, you know, at the top of a, of a, a food chain or whatever, whoever is there has a much better chance of making out very well if there's some kind of catastrophe than someone at the bottom of that. That's a, so uh, you game the system so that there will, so that it's more likely that there will be a catastrophe, and the people at the top, of course, stand not to lose, but perhaps even to gain. 
and uh, Naomi Klein uh, documented that quite uh, nicely in her book, Disaster Capitalism, which I uh, talked about very early, I think, in this live stream sequence. But now, the problem of the present administration with this, this has to do with supply chain shortages and the fact that we have inflation now. This, things are gone. And of course, they are inflated because certain things are in a great, in great deficit. So you have uh, computer chips which for cars are, are not being manufactured uh, at the speed that they should be all of a sudden. Uh, and so you have a, a problem of, of, const of building cars now, new cars, and you have a glut on the used car market and increasing prices. I've talked about this also. Uh, and there's a problem of, of, of course, the shipping and the trucking. Once you have this, uh, so Biden did something which is, I think, you know, is good in in itself. Is is to have the Los Angeles uh, port actually begin to work. Is something happening here? Okay, maybe that's uh, uh, forget it. I don't. I don't make any kind of silly comment. Uh, but so Biden has opened have the port, port work for uh, on twenty four hour shifts. Uh, but the big problem is, are are the trucker companies and trucking the the people who take goods from the container ships and from there to than other depots. Now, <clears throat> he, he even, Biden even talked about, the, the, or the administration even talked about mobilizing the National Guard to help out with this. Now, this is, of course, a ridiculous thing. Uh, first of all, if you have private companies and you have someone who is not... Uh, properly licensed employees dealing with the, the shipping, you have tremendous problems with uh, insurance coverage, the, any issues of liability. And uh, plus, you think of the, of, you know, the job of, of, of driving the truck and actually calling this as being totally unskilled. Anyone can do it. Of course, that's not at all true as well. Uh, but what what that does? So this idea of actually uh, increasing the pool of drivers, a, a pool of workers. What that does is actually it puts workers' <clears throat> livelihoods in greater jeopardy because the big the you have a big problem is. Uh, let me see if I can, I can, yeah, uh, the, these truckers, especially these, these people who are, are working in the docks there, they, they are all independent contractors, and they're, who are waiting, wait, they wait for work, this way. And what, will, what this will do is actually even lower the rate of pay even more to make it even less sustainable than it is now, you see. So what instead you, the government should do, because, and I, I should uh, go back, because you, you see profit margins, now you have inflation, but profit margins in com companies are going up together 
with inflationary uh, uh, pressure. So, it's, instead of uh, management, when we say, okay, we have this, this problem, for the short term, we will take uh, cuts in this, we will take cuts, in order to ensure that the people who are working have both decent incentives and uh, decent ways of surviving. That's right. Uh, yeah, incredible. That's right. You see. So I read here. That says there's a site uh, in on the internet called Naked Capitalism, which is uh, incredibly uh, useful, and uh, it is maybe the uh, most uh, interesting, valuable uh, economics uh, little site uh, uh, on the internet, at least that I've found. And, No. What do they say here is that this is what the administration could do. That's a Bloomberg announced. They say Biden races the clock and holds few tools in supply chain crisis. He says. No, he says. Trucking is an industry long beset by grueling hours and declining pay. Few know the, those hardships better than port truck drivers. Port truckers are typically independent contractors. This is everything that I've been saying. Now, the port truck driver for decades now has basically been the slack adjuster of the whole system. This is a, said by Steve Viskelly, an economic sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania. He said the the entire system is built around free labor from truck drivers as they wait for containers. So they just wait, and for that amount of time, they're not paid anything. And then they hope to be paid enough when they actually get a job. That way. Uh, now, what should happen is that Biden should encourage organization of the drivers so that they can bargain for better pay and benefits. But the president instead is focused on trying to produce new drivers and st to streamline licensing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what that will do, of course, is simply drive the wages of these people even further down, and if they, the wages are unsustainable, of course people will not work in this field. Okay. Uh, now, what's also said here is you say hourly employees, and we all know about this, and essential workers in healthcare and food industry are hurting due to inflation as big companies are still raking in record profits. This has to stop. Now, the United States government in the last years has spent trillions of dollars anyway bailing out business. Now, what Biden, the administration could say, we expect all of you, these are businesses now, to curtail your profits for the next two quarters or so, so that middle class and poor Americans don't have to sweat if they can pay bills over the holiday season. Now, corporate executives may, should moderate their bonuses out of respect for the sacrifices including the sacrifice of their lives that our essential workers have made in, during this COVID crisis. Okay. Uh, now, Biden's, of course, uh, approval ratings are, are, are tanking. 
And that's because you don't have messaging which somehow grabs the attention of most people. Yeah. Something like this, of course, would, would grab the attention of people. Now, uh, this, there's a lot of articles in, uh, in uh, this uh, Naked Capitalism, which are, are really fascinating. Um, but what I talk about now is the origins of this supply chain crisis and the inflation comes from the fact that when orders for, for goods, etc., etc., really tanked early in the pandemic throughout the world, of course business is closed down. It, uh, of course they uh, stop producing. But what you did not have was a government policy which would actually support the continuation of the so-called supply chain, let's say, during this period, you see. So then all of a sudden, they workers were laid off, uh, production was curtailed, and, and this had, and then now, as things are opening up after just, in fact, in uh, his, historical terms, this is a rather short period of time, uh, it's opening up this way, and the businesses cannot meet the sudden excess demand. Yeah. So this is exactly the problem that business by, them, by themselves cannot be expected to uh, weather something like a pandemic without governmental, institutional, considerable help this way. And this, the problem, this supply chain problem, is uh, something which was completely uh, obvious from very early on. Okay, uh, just a couple more thoughts on this subject. And, of course, the sort of globalization that we have, which really means very much the uh, concentration in a few places of basic sort of manufacturing capability, is what uh, has also created this problem, you see. And we, we all uh, worry about China, everything's China. And still, just myself, of course I'm like everybody, and I talked about this last week, the, when the times before, uh, I'm ordering so much online now, like, like everyone. This is this, this new uh, kind of, uh, Hyper ordering, I should say. That's that. It's probably going to continue for a long time. Uh, although I do miss, uh, in fact, actually going to places and also sort of just looking around and seeing this. Oh, this is nice. This is nice. And which you, which you now you 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 do this uh, on the internet, and uh, you can't really tell what's what you are actually seeing, particular. Uh, let me actually, I'm going to do something very funny. I don't, I don't have, do I have what I really want? Yeah. Uh, here.
I've been very interested in 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 different in these the tubes I was talking about to extend the. Am, am I okay? Can't, no, no, not yet. I, I'll show it eventually. <laughs> but I want I want to show more stuff. In fact, no, I don't think I, I think my most egregious example. I don't I don't have here. Uh, and there used to be, in New York City, near Chinatown, which was actually a very nice thing, because was, uh, I would go to the store. It was called Canal Street Rubber. And it was basically a store which sold scraps and probably did sell to industries also, different things. But it had this whole of different scraps of all sorts of, of rubber material. Next to that, there was also... Uh, Canal Street Plastic uh, also sold scraps. And not so far away were some of my favorite Chinese restaurants. So I would go and have lunch and then go and visit, uh, especially Canal Street Rubber, where I, I would look for different scraps of, of rubber tubing with the right size, the right thickness, the right kind of sponginess that I, I liked. Uh, now, of course, that went out of business. And this is way before any kind of pandemic. Uh, and so I was forced then to actually just really look on the internet for things. And what has happened since then, I, sometimes I, I sort of hit it almost right, but since it's it's hard to read exactly what these materials are that you know on the, in these various sites, <clears throat> I've come across I've I've bought things like this, hoping that they would be the right size. Uh, do you, can you see this <laughs> here for the for the for the clarinet? This is actually a smaller size. I've but some things have come like that big. Okay. I've also uh, ended up with, with material like this, which looked very attractive. It was, everything was correct, except the material itself is unbending and uh, completely unusable for, for something of this sort. Uh, well, we still search for things, and I, I, I mentioned that these uh, most recent investments in in tubing, which were discovered by my uh, compatriot Ming Jie Wang, and and uh, that, that seems to be it seemed to be pretty good. Uh, in but my point is, though, that. The concentration of industries in just certain places, and of, and almost all these two, all this tubing is made in China. That's what I had, and shipped here. That uh, the concentration, of course, will lead if there is a if there is a breakdown in any kind of transportation or something, will lead to actually severe shortages of many products that way. And still to this day, I mean, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm ordering stuff, and I still find things, everything here comes here, and again, it's made in China, made in Indonesia, this is the way, this is the way it is. And I've uh, taken very late at night to, to, watch, to watching some television crime show here and there, something of sort. I keep trying to wean myself from it, from something like that, but uh, probably will eventually. But 
it comes with commercials, which is something that I hadn't experienced for a long time because I never bothered watching any kind of uh, television, let's say. I'm just watching it on my computer. But anyway, they're commercials. And we have this big commercial about Jeep, which has this big thing about America. And you have the space, uh, you know, rocket shuttle. You have shooting, you have planes, you have military, you have this and that, the other thing. Then you have this Jeep. It's all about America. And in the fine print there, you can say, it says, assembled in the United States from foreign parts. Okay. Uh, it's not one for me to judge that, to say that, no, everything should be made in the United States, blah, 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 blah that is. But just that what we have even there is, is we, we have uh, propaganda, in a say, uh, uh, trying to show how this company is American, and yet it's not that way. And this is leading to great confusion, I think, among many people in the United States. And this sort of lack of, of clarity of, of our present administration sort of supporting just what you call just ordinary people, let's say. It's, uh, uh, some people, sometimes they say real people, of course, everybody's a person. Uh, that may end up being the downfall of them. And then that will mean the downfall of this build better bill. It will be the downfall of working towards alleviating global warming and the downfall maybe of democracy so-called democracy, I should say, in the United States, which, of course, is very dangerous not only for the U.S., but for the rest of the world, which is also experiencing <clears throat> really great, uh, I should say, uh, sort of movements toward autocracy, we could say. All right, I'm going to stop almost now. And as I have just, very, just a little bit to play, but I wanted to demonstrate also. But before that, just one last thing, which I think just to change the subject completely. And this was something from this, the Smithsonian. There are lots of interesting stuff. But this is a project which is attempting to interpret the uh, sperm whale, the sort of clicks, vocalizations that they make, and to, to try to figure out if that is in fact a language. And then to try to actually speak with them. In other words, to translate the language of the sperm whale so that we as humans can actually talk to them. I think this is absolutely fascinating. And uh, of course, this has been the, brought up from ancient times as the biggest difference between humans and what were generally called animals, as if we're not animals ourselves. Uh, and little by little, we find out that the world is much more complicated than that. Okay, that said, I move now back to a topic which I actually know something about, which is music. There. 
But I want to mention before that, I keep saying this, right? Yeah, that I spend all this time haranguing about different topics because as ambassadors of culture, we must be well educated in political realities and economic realities because cultural issues end up very often, most often, I say all the time, being uh, the victims of social and economic policies. And, uh, I mean, if we take the largest orchestras, for instance, in the United States, perhaps they will survive, although they are all very highly leveraged, I would say. There's one of them there. But uh, uh, the, the, the problem in the United States are small venues, chamber music series, I've t I talked about that also very early, etc., who have had a lot of trouble trying to survive and have budgets of, of course, under $1 million. It's a very small, I mean, this is amounts of money which certain people make in a couple minutes. Uh, you see, and yet, often are saying that, okay, this is not needed. But we must make a stand against that. And the only way that we can actually argue against that is by having the knowledge about what to argue. Okay. And, uh-oh. <laughs> I just got my warning that, that I have overshot my time limit once again. Okay, so uh, let me put this here now. Maybe I stand up again. And I demonstrated earlier various uh, Things like the breathing bag, breath builders, which are all very important, I think very, very uh, good things to, to use. Uh, the idea of, of here... Well, today I was so excited, I even forgot my coffee. You know, rubber bands and... and feeling this, feeling fingers with rubber bands, etc., etc., and talking about the embouchure, the, the, the tongue, the, the, the exercise with the reed, all of that, I believe I've mentioned. But I still find that everything that I say can be somehow misinterpreted. Anyway. So I've come up uh, with yet one more exercise. Uh, actually, before that, I go to this once again, this uh, little thing, which is so funny. Here. This thing, here. Oh. Oh, my God. Which is actually very good. I, I think it's quite good for strengthening the muscles. I come back to my normal phase here. But the biggest problem with all of that that I'm talking about, except the rubber band does give us a, a, a kind of an analogy to what's necessary, is to, to feel what actually should be happening in the mouth. And I've even talked about the, the beginnings exercise and how you do everything together this way. 
Let me put this here, and maybe I should. Um, you know, I like to do something like this. To read. I don't know if that's just superstition, but uh, uh, I think it does remind the reed that it should be buoyant somehow. Let's have to. So beginnings. Something like that, where you do everything together. But I did mention, I believe, something which is perhaps a, uh, a bit enigmatic, and it's that when you start the note, you, in a certain way, you don't close your mouth, but you open it. All right. And that's like, huh? That's impossible. Okay. But I, you have this stretch with the rubber band. Let me get a rubber band. You have this, I use a big one now, but this kind of, and you feel this, but I said this force here. But I still find that people don't quite understand what I'm talking about. So finally, I maybe have the answer. And of course I'm going to find something else later, in the, maybe even the near future as well. But... It's from a long time ago. I, I I would mention this kind of a kind of a that way, uh, and certain people can do it, and certain people could not do it this way. And I understood now th what the problem was with the people who could not do it, because what is actually happening is you're taking your lips here and you're pulling in. So you're creating a vacuum, you're sucking into your mouth. And, you, and then when you do that sucking in, you pull your li lips open, you actually get the sound. And the more that you're sucking in, the better the sound is. Yeah. So, I understood that doing this here, uh, first of all, people do this. I, I should uh, mention this first. I, I found people do this. Oh, it can't work. Or people do this kind of, they do suck, but go, and they release their lips this way. But you have to feel how the lip in the armature, this is again this whole mm, with that, and I mentioned how you pull the, the reed into your mouth when you're doing, here, I, I give you this exercise again. When I do this, I'll probably keep doing this periodically because these exercises I think are really critical. Uh, I'm rather proud of them. Uh, and you go, so you are pulling this here, and you have to pull this in with while you're doing it. So you don't go, but that way. Whoops! At least my floor is rather clean. Uh, but this here, you feel, really feel how the, the lips pull into, onto your face as you, as you suck in. And then that, instead of releasing the pressure here, you hold the pressure. So that way. So I'll maintain it even more. You can all try. Of course, I can't uh, 
experience you, but that way. Now for the important part. If you do that and then play, you will find that your playing is freer, that going between registers, and once you know the parcels especially, it becomes easier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now, the, what is critical with this is the very beginning of this action of pulling the, the jaw open like that. That is the embouchure. And that's what I mean when I say that you actually open your mouth when you, when you start a note, when you begin a note. So this is, so this, that blowing in with this pressure all in, that actually creates the feeling that I mentioned when I said mentioned the rubber band here. And then, opens that way. So that's what I wanted to talk about. This is my new kind of quasi-discovery, I should say. And uh, try it out. Yeah. Now I will move to playing these two pieces of the composer Carol Husa. Carol Husa is a very interesting composer who I think probably many of you know because he wrote uh, some important works for wind ensemble, but not only that. And he wrote these three studies for solo clarinet here. which then he, he actually uh, has a nice little dedication to me with sincere thanks as he's writing. And I'm, I have to say that I uh, liked a lot of his music, but I'd forgotten about this piece. I felt ba feel badly about that. And I want to play the first two of them. These, these are I say three studies, and I uh, talked about etudes, which are studies. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that here. Here we are. <laughs> okay, these three studies. Uh, etudes are studies, and these first two of them are uh, I like particularly. So I will play them for you. No. The first one, he titles Mountain Bird, and the second one, Poignant Song. And here, I'll, I'll go like this. Let's say, just I make no pretense, I am simply reading this. Okay, so this is the first one, Mountain Bird.
This is number two, Poignant Song.
that's the I was going to end with Marian Anderson singing of Schubert's Death and the Maiden. But perhaps this already is a nice ending for today's little live stream session. And I will save Marian Anderson for another time. So with that, please everyone be well, take care, and thanks for bearing with me.